So welcome everyone to up to how to optimize profitability in your wine program. I'm Alicia Towns Prinken, I'm Vice President of Wine of Archer Roos, as well as Head of Mentorship and a member of the Board of Directors for Wine Unify, who I'd like to thank for their support today. Um, our topic today is optimizing wine profitability. And um, I would love to introduce our panelists who are absolutely fantastic and some of my favorite people in the industry and want to thank them for being here today. Um, I know everyone is busy. I'll start with my boss, uh, Marion Leitner um, of Archer Roos. She's a CEO and co-founder. Um, Archer Roos is on the quest to bring consumers a better glass of wine no matter where they are. They unite world-class winemaking, a transparent supply chain and sustainable packaging to bring consumers a better glass of wine. Their, or I should say our, award-winning portfolio is available via direct-to-consumers and in retailers such as Wegman, Total Wine, and on airlines like JetBlue. Welcome, Marian. Um, next Thanks is, so much. sorry. Um, next is a good friend of mine, Gary Obligacion, who is a seasoned hospitality executive, one of the best dancers I know, and mm -hmm. is currently the director of development for the Alinea Group in Chicago, which owns and operates four Chicago-based award-winning restaurants, Alinea, Next, Aviary, and Royster. Gary is specifically focused on the group launching food and beverage operations in the recently developed St. Regis Tower, scheduled to begin operations Q3 of this year. Um, this is Gary's second time with the Alinea Group, having earlier served as Director of Operations. Um, prior to his return to Chicago, Gary was the General Manager at the Post Ranch Inn in Big Sur, one of the country's top boutique luxury hotel properties. And then, there's our friends Kenny and Matt of Weston Wilder. Um, Kenny has always worked with wine, beginning with a fine wine shop while at university. Um, he worked wine production, marketing, and general management roles with California wineries. Most recently, he launched the brand Cirque and spearheaded sales and marketing for Pinot Noir Heroes Costa Brown. No stranger to the world of highly allocated brands, he was drawn to a product, a project that brought the same level of focus and quality to something more widely available and fun. And it is fun. Um, and Matt has always worked in and around marketing. Um, and it was a dalliance with the wine business years ago that led to this friendship. Um, frequently responsible for creating and launching products, Matt has worked extensively with clean tech businesses, both in startup and IPO stages. The opportunity to work with a good friend and with wine again made Matt smile. That's very new. <laughs> um, Bobby Stuckey, one of my heroes, is a master sommelier um, since 2004. Um, Bobby began his distinguished career in the restaurants in his hometown of Arizona, working his way from dishwasher to management. That is how you do it. Um, establishing his position as one of the leaders in the hospitality industry. Before opening his list of restaurants, um, I like to call it an empire, he has told me not to say that. Um, Bobby worked at the Little Nell and the French Laundry earning numerous awards for wine and service not once but multiple times including Gourmet's Best Wine Service Award, Mobile Travel Guides, Five Star Hotel and Restaurant Rating, Wine Spectators Grand Award, and, and the James Beer Foundation for Outstanding Wine Service and Wine Director of the Year. Welcome, Bobby. Um, so just to take a deeper dive into this topic um, and to sort of set the stage, we all love the restaurant industry, and the restaurant industry was probably the most... Um, the industry in the nation that has suffered the most. Um, significant sales and job losses since COVID-19. Uh, more than 8 million restaurant employees were laid off or furloughed, and the industry lost a staggering $280 billion in sales during the first 13 months of the pandemic. So why are we here today? Um, there are so many reasons. Everyone on this panel cares about wine, hospitality, sustainability, and finding solutions to the problem that restaurants will continue to face in the years to come as we rebuild. 
it has been more important for restaurateurs to find unique and cost-effective ways to thrive while simultaneously creating beautiful and inviting experiences for the guests. New and exciting opportunities exist for alternative packaging like can and keg wine and beyond in order to achieve these goals. So let's explore this a little bit. Um, Bobby, I was hoping, uh, Marion, excuse me, I was hoping that you could sort of talk about how this conversation came to be. Oh, thank you for being a conversation today. I, I just feel uh, So this conversation really started uh, because Alicia and I have spent a lot of time talking about what are some of the things that the pandemic has really hit home. And one of them is about the vital role that restaurants play in our society. And over the past 14 months, there are so many people who have said to me how much they've missed that experience of going in and being able to really connect with their loved ones or strangers, uh, you know, in a hospitality environment, uh, that feeling of being taken care of. And now it's, it, as we, the pandemic, well, hopefully with this vaccine and putting the pandemic behind us, it's, it's more vital than ever that we really think through how do we help restaurants come back and come back as quickly as possible. And you know, one of the things that I think there's a conversation in, in the industry now is how do we really ensure that we're setting them up for profitability? Uh, as, you know, Bobby uh, said earlier, most of the restaurants were averaging, uh, you know, five and a half percent gross profit before the pandemic. So as we're kind of navigating our way out here, how do we really set things up for success? And that's really given our line of work at Archer Roos, where we really focus on alternative of packaging, we really see our role that we can play within that uh, as being able to solve some issues that have long kind of plagued wine programs, whether that be, you know, waste uh, from opening up a bottle or not being able to get the full um, profit back from uh, through wine by the glass. How do you manage inventory better? And that's actually what we think that the role of alternative packaging could play. Um, and that's really why we, we started reaching out to our friends to see if they'd be willing to enjoy it, join us in this discussion as we could, we can brainstorm ways uh, and share our knowledge others as they also have out of the pandemic. Great, thank you, Marianne. Um, Bobby, you are one of the co-founders of the Independent Restaurant Coalition. Um, you worked tirelessly um, throughout and still are um, during the pandemic to help find some relief for restaurateurs. Um, could you give us sort of an overview of what last year has looked like? Yeah, I think, um, I think as we look at last year and the years leading up to this, it will help us with our vision on how we have to move forward. Um, you know, I've been in the restaurant business my entire adult life, uh, most of my adolescent life. And uh, I've owned my restaurants for 17 years and I did not know how fragile the footing of our industry was. Uh, to a little bit of a, so everyone can understand where we are. We woke up, we were closed March 16th around the country and we started the Independent Restaurant Coalition to advocate for our industry. Um, we knew we needed advocate, uh, advocacy group for the independents. There's 500,000 independent, or there were 500,000 independent restaurants in America that made up 10% of the American workforce, uh, uh, 11 million jobs. Um, but the problem was we were closed. And as we delved into this and helped write what would, what would become the Restaurant Revitalization Act that was passed through uh, Senator Majority Leader Schumer and, and Joseph Biden, President Biden, um, we realized that 2019, which was a, a fantastic economic year, we had an industry average of 5.9% profit. Um, that's, that's so unhealthy on so many fronts because restaurants are the, they are also what make up the food chain system in America. Uh, you saw those those numbers of how many animals were being euthanized last spring when we weren't open. Through my work with the IRC, listening to farmers in Iowa or farmers in Idaho or Georgia, them screaming that we needed to help restaurants because the food supply chain was so messed up with us being at reduced 
capacities. Um, also, um, we just need to get this industry on a better footing. So the, the first step is we get this package released by the SBA. Let's get ourselves through this. But then I hope that the Independent Restaurant Coalition can work in the future on a civic, state, and federal level to make sure we, we look at restaurants differently. Um, I spoke to over 100 congressmen and senators this year, and it's amazing how many of them had never heard in a meeting from a restaurateur. They knew restaurateurs, they ate at restaurants, they all loved them, but they didn't know that the problems what our industry was going through, and we've just not been good at vocalizing that. So maybe our level set is we need to work on profitability in the future, but we need to do it in a couple different ways. One is it how we operate, two, how society sees us, Society needs to pay more for food at restaurants. It's just, it's, it's just a fact of life. Um, and also how our civic, like if you go into bouldergov.com right now and I type in, uh, I'm bringing 200 jobs to Boulder, what is there for benefits? It literally lists what it would do for a business bringing jobs to Boulder with the exception, boldly said there, except for the hospitality restaurant industry. Society looks at us like low paying jobs that should not be helped. So there, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, now going into this last year, was it scary? It was frightening. Did I grind my teeth down? Immensely. Trying to provide insurance and benefits for 200 employees during pandemic is, is hard to do. Um, but we did that word that everyone says. We pivoted here, we pivoted there. Um, we got through it as a team or we're getting through it as a team. But really the big thing is how can we make this industry more stable in the future? Because it's, I might've mentioned this earlier. I really look at it as, think of it as like biology. We're the cornerstone species in the greater US economic society and economic ecosystem. And it's like it, when the when the sea otter dies, uh, go is taken out of the ocean. The ocean caves in around it. That's kind of how restaurants are. So. Thank you for that. Um, I agree. You know, and restaurants are so important. I mean, it's whether it's a graduation or a Tuesday night or any celebration or just eating. Um, we are absolutely the fiber of this country in so many ways. Um, Gary, I love that you are such the hospitality guy. You know, every time I'm with you, I, I feel taken care of. It's one of the things that you are incredibly good at. Well, many other things, but the problems that we're, restaurants are going to face, what are those? What do you see going forward? We know that certain things have to change, but what do you think they're going to need? And what do you think customers are expecting as restaurants start to reopen their doors? It's really interesting you phrased it that way. Um, I think that the, the biggest challenge that I see is to, to actually set expectations because they're different from whatever um, point of view you're looking at it from. Hospitality will always exist and needs to exist in any number of industries. We, we actually um, are able to, to boil it down to its essence. People come in, we take good care of them, they go on. But hospitality exists in your dentist's office, with your mechanic, uh, with your mailman. Hospitality components are always there and they, they make those interactions better. But more so, it's looking at the, the expectations from the guest's point of view, from the operator's point of view, from the server's point of view, you know, from the actual employee. And, and that's where things are kind of messed up. Um, I, I'd, let me put it this way. We, um, the, the world, as Bobby was pointing out, kind of shut down here in the United States in, in the middle of March 2020. And when that occurred, everything shut down at once. And in different venues or different regions across the United States, uh, there were varying, there were varying uh, gradients of open, closed, shut down or not, whatever that was. However, the world did change no matter what. As it opened up again, uh, restaurants would open uh, and, and guests would walk in. They expected things to be exactly back as they were back in 2019. The reality was the employees going back to those environments had a very different point of view because they weren't necessarily prepared to provide service exactly the same manner they had before. And that's the problem. They were thinking of, do I feel safe? 
do I have peace of mind? Am I being taken care of? And, and they weren't necessarily prepared to open up and, and be table side and clearing tables or taking food or talking face to face with a guest that maybe didn't have a mask on. This is pre-vaccine. This is changing as, as we move. This is a moving target. But the expectations have to be clear from all those points of view. Uh, the other one is from the operator. The operator has to understand, like, like Bobby also pointed out, that the way we were structured as an industry in hospitality wasn't correct. You have a variety of people who are very, very good at, at providing service or creating food or, or doing things in the restaurant environment that weren't necessarily top business. And so they're taking tonight's receipts and they're taking care of you know, bills that were deliveries from 90 days ago. That's not a sustainable model, which is why the profit margin is so low because they're playing catch up on a night by night basis on things that happened literally a quarter ago. Th that's impossible. So making sure that they understand one, take care of what I have today um, so I can actually be open tomorrow. The hardest thing that I see from talking to all my friends in the industry in any city or rural environment across the United States is staffing. Because what happened when this world shut down and you know you have 10% of the workforce that's out of work for a sustained period of time, many of them left the industry to never return. Um, some um, maybe just left a region. I'm here in Chicago and a lot of the people we counted on to be here to come back to work, move back to wherever they're from, be it a, a rural state or another city or someplace other than Chicago. So we pick up the phone to call them, but they're now living back in Ohio or they're in you know, Illinois or, or Iowa or some other place that isn't here. They're not here to count on and others just went away. So is it gonna be the roaring 20s? Maybe from the guest point of view, that's what they want. Um, are we prepared to, to execute that? Well, many businesses can open if we're only allowed to have 50% capacity or you know 75% capacity even because you have very tiny footprints sometimes with tables very, very close together. And I'm allowed to open up to 75%, but my tables have to be six feet apart. Those two don't necessarily equate to one another. So establishing what are the rules of engagement so that each one of these groups, you know, be it the operator, be it the employer, be it the employee, be it the guest, are able to have their desires met, their wants and needs fulfilled. And we just have to figure out what it is we're all trying to do and see where they actually intersect. That's fantastic. Thank you. That's a great overview. Um, this talk is about alternative packaging for wine. And so, Marion, can you talk a bit about the category and then what sort of drove you to start Archer Roos? Absolutely. Um, so, first of all, just to give a little framework around the can or the alternative packaging category. Um, so, canned wine has really been around for the last ten years, but in the five in the last five years, we've seen a ton of activity, um, and uh, it's actually a segment that grew 150 percent over the last five percent growth. When canned wine first burst onto the scene, there was a lot of questions around quality and stigma around these formats. But what's been interesting about the pandemic is how, what an acceleration of acceptance we've seen across alternative packaging. The thing that's also been really interesting is that, uh, you know, from an Archer Roost perspective, we actually built our brand in the on-premise. So from the very early days, uh, we, we really felt that the best way to build this category was is by aligning ourselves with bars and restaurants. We felt really strongly that we were naturally aligned partners, even though it might be very different than the typical experience. But if you were really willing to put a focus on quality, uh, that there was a lot of synergies between the restaurant industry and canned wine. Uh, and that was making sure that there was no waste. So that uh, making sure that every glass of wine that you sold was profitable. One-to-one -one inventory management. Um, and then, of course, allowing wine to go where typically it might not have gone before because we were eliminating us. So suddenly music venues, uh, more outdoor patios, all of this kind of became fair game for the wine drinker. And that really comes back to the heart of why we started our Jerusalem in the first place, which was we wanted to bring consumers a better glass of wine and to bring um, or make quality wine more accessible. And I, I say those words and what does that really mean? Because frankly, it comes down to what I like to call the Monday to Thursday night conundrum, 
which is that how can, you know, for many people, there's that nightly debate of whether or not they can open up a bottle of wine and finish it in one setting. Uh, and the great thing about canned wine is that it's inherently a portion control. It allows for this controlled pour. And that works just as well in your home as it does in you know, a hospitality setting, provided that the quality is there. And so one of the things that we have worked so hard on, and I'm so thrilled to be on this panel with, with other brands that have done the same, is really put that emphasis on quality so that alternative packaging, you're not sacrificing quality in order to get at those other benefits. Uh, and ask us that uh, there were some concepts in the restaurant industry where kegs made a ton of sense, uh, particularly ones that were moving volume. And that allowed us to actually save on packaging so that we could pass those savings on to the restaurant industry and give them a better price per ounce uh, from a poor. So this has all been about how can we do a better, this was all about how we can uh, how can we better service our partners and our end consumers, whether they be in the settings of their home or sitting in, in restaurants? Great, thank you so much. Um, um, Matt and Kenny, um, Weston Wilder, can you tell us a bit about Weston Wilder, but also what I love is your 1% to the planet, you know, um, demand for sustainable, sustainably produced products has skyrocketed in years, um, for the last few years. Can you tell us what that looks like at Western Wilder? First of all, I just wanted to, to kind of follow on to what Marion was saying about accessibility. And that was one of the things that kind of inspired us to get away from traditional glass bottles and our fine wine experience and get into something that, that to us made sense as consumers, making wine more portable, uh, lighter, easier to ship and all that good stuff, but also retaining that high quality. And also we were kind of, um, we, we were kind of stuck before in this world of um, gauging a wine brand's success by how expensive it became or how hard it was to gain access to or how long it sat in someone's cellar. And we were thinking, you know, wine should really, if we want wine to succeed, we should really be drinking more of it. We should really be making it more accessible and more fun, quite frankly. And we looked at craft beer and we looked at the fun that, that that industry was having with cans and with their labels and their packaging and so forth. And we thought, well, why isn't wine doing that? So that was our kind of trigger initially to get into cans, as well as combining that with the kind of common sense and the sustainability angle. Right. And sustainability was kind of one of our, uh, I guess, pillars and certainly something that the rest of the craft beer and alternative packaging um, uh, formats have been enjoying for quite some time. We wanted to carry that further um, in our, in essentially having a philanthropic arm. Uh, we're all in, it, it seems we all have kind of a holistic approach to our business where we're wanting to give back to the communities uh, that enjoy our products. And so membership with 1% for the planet was one of our requirements where we can actually make contributions um, towards preserving the parks and public spaces and the areas where we um, uh, sell and produce and and enjoy our wines and what inspire us at the same time. That's great, thank you so much. Um, Bobby, what would you like to add to that? And we'd love to learn a bit about Scarpetta as well. Sure, um, you know, Scarpetta is um, uh, a wine that we, uh, my business partner Lachlan McKinnon Patterson and I started in 2007. Uh, I think we were the first people to bring a, a canned Lambrusco to North America. Yep. So we're a big fan of the, uh, uh, canned wines and also as an operator when we talk about profitability um look our whole world in restaurants is starting with a a big bucket of sand and try to keep as much sand in the bucket at the end of the month as possible um canned uh, alternative packages from canned wine to keg wine can give operators such a better touch of where they are inventory wise especially in those high volume wines that are by the glass and things like that. Um, you know, we've been big proponents of that. We, we think it works really, really well. Um, not all of our wines are canned, just two selections of Rizzante and the Lambrusco. Um, but we also were one of the first people to uh, buy, a, I can't believe this, it feels like a hundred years ago, to buy a screw cap machine in Friuli, Italy. Uh, you know, it's a very 
uh, slow moving world over there in Friuli. And I remember when we wanted to get a, uh, to do screw cap on our Pinot Grigio in 2008, there wasn't one and there was no mobile ones in Friuli, only one other winery had one. So we bought one for the winery that we worked with because we thought those things were important. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've been enjoying canned wine for a while now, whether it's in my beach bag or any given night. Um, you know, my husband has a can of Archer Roos bubbly every night to make a, an Aperol spritz. And I'm usually drinking something else. So that's, that's also great to know that the cla glass of wine you're going to get is what you specifically want and has not been opened forever. Um, so we, we've sort of touched base on this and how to optimize our, the profitability of a wine program, but as so bars and restaurants rebound from the pandemic, um, preserving craftsmanship and artistry is critical like never before. So how can these formats be leveraged in an uncertain environment to drive profitability of bar programs, particularly thinking um, wines by the glass and cocktails? Uh, Marion, you wanna kick us off there? Absolutely. Um, and I, I think here that what's important to remember is that formats are just formats. And what it's all about, every great cocktail or every great wine glass really starts with what is the quality of the offerings that, that are there. And that's what's so exciting about what's happened in the canned wine space is just the, how many other great quality offerings <laughs> Are now on the market today, um, just like what that's going to put in, which really allows it to be a great foundation or building block for these different programs. And going back to kind of what you were both Bobby and Gary and Alicia and Matt and Kenny, what you guys have all alluded to so far, which is just that the great thing about alternative packaging is the options that it gives you. So uh, one of the things that we always talk about, for instance, is like uh, Alicia, what you were saying about creating a spritz at the end of the day. You know, if you just want to have one spritz, uh, you don't want to open up a whole bottle of, of sparkling uh, just to make one glass. That's where cans are perfect. And so we've been working really hard with our partners in order to create what we like to call can cocktails. So just fun, uh, fun recipes of how you can use our wines in different ways to make really fun cocktails uh, that both bring pleasure to the, to the drinker, but at the same time, you are not then opening up an, ent an entire bottle of uh, Prosecco where there is a clicking talk, a click, excuse me, clock, uh, bottle is going to go flat. Uh, and the same thing goes with, you know, when as consumers are venturing out of their homes and coming back to restaurants, they're going to want options uh, for their wine by the glass uh, programs. Still, the steady stream, and particularly because capacities vary in different cities, it's going to be increasingly important that we think about ways to keep offerings fresh um, and at the same time keep a handle on costs. And that's where, you know, having that, having a can on the ready where you're just pouring that into a glass before you serve that, as opposed to just uh, opening up a bottle on a Monday night and praying that in the next 24 hours, there's enough uh, people or visitors to your location in order to make sure that you're still serving it while the, the wine is fresh is critical. Um, and so that's why I think it's a responsibility now for us as suppliers to really be at a place of listening and, and really act as collaborators to understand what are the focus of these programs as they're, uh, as they're coming back? What are the areas that they've identified that they want to focus on? And then it is our responsibility to really take that information and help provide solutions and be collaborators with them to make sure that we're supporting them in the best ways possible. That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, does anyone else want to add to that? Sure, I'll step in. Um, just real quick, so much of what even Bobby alluded to a few minutes ago uh, of what happens with the money in restaurants is it, it's, it just disappears due to any number of factors and waste is a huge one where, you know, we just don't know how much is just being poured off. I mean, if you have a bartender or a server that's pouring a glass of wine and they're just a half ounce off, you know, but over and over and over again, that equates to bottles and cases and pallets over time. So if we're able to use the can and, and measure either portion control, so now that's measured. I don't have to worry about paying, pouring too much or shorting the guests and pouring too little. You know, that, that's either one of those is, is gonna make sure that we're satisfied there. The other part is, well, if you pull a cork, 
uh, and you open a bottle of wine, well, now you have an expiration. It, it is that ticking clock like you're talking about. And now that bottle is degrading over time. If that is fresh for that environment right now, that guest, you open it, you pour it, done, then that is guaranteed to be at least exactly what it's supposed to be. And that's an important aspect. I think that the, the biggest part here is 15 years ago, having a conversation about canned wine was a very, very short conversation, right? There weren't a lot of options. Now there, there's a market for it. And, and I think the consumer, much like with screw caps, is becoming uh, conditioned to understand that there is a quality product that can be available in a can. You know, it can exist and they can get a product that's going to taste good, it's going to be good, and they're trusting uh, the team that's putting this wine in front of them. And I think that's all, that's part of it. So profitability comes from all these different things in concert. And these margins are super fine. And, and as Bobby was talking about that earlier, it reminds me of um, an accountant I worked with once at a restaurant who laid out a hundred pennies at the start of our chat. And she said, look, five of those are gonna be left at the end if we're lucky. And that's our margin. And so you've got this really strong visual of how small success, how small that margin is for success within that industry anyway, if you're doing all of this right. If you're doing something wrong or something comes out of left field or you're experiencing extra waste or you've got a case of wine you bought that ended up all having Britannomyces or is corked or whatever and you can't use it, those five pennies go away and you're left with nothing. So that's what's in the back of my mind all the time is thinking about, well, this, this is, you know, we've got to, we, we have a role to play in helping people operate a sustainable business, not just in terms of materials and environment, but in terms of economic sustainability. Um, and if we can, if we can offer a, a, a high quality wine that is guaranteed to um, deliver and bring pleasure every single time it's opened in a measurable and safe manner, uh, COVID safe manner at that, you know, that's the other thing about cans is, you know, these are, these are things that are your personal thing to, to, to look after and to enjoy or to share. It's not a bottle that's being passed around or it's not a bottle that someone else has had. This is yours and it's safe for you. Then I think that's an, an important service. Thank you. Bobby, you have anything to add there? Well, I also think I, I love the can piece. I also love, um, you know, Europe has had vino sfuso or wine on tap as part of their culture for forever. Like if you're in Northern Italy, you literally go into a winery with your milk jug, fill it up, take it home, and that's your wine for the night. Restaurants could really use this. And now that there's this technology from the lender system, these key kegs, where you don't have to have the, the typical, what we would call um, a Guinness, uh, blend of gases. You can literally do it with a, a key keg where the, the keg uh, collapses on itself, fights oxidation. Uh, you can really monitor what you're, you're selling and take care of waste that way. I mean, just think about if you're a restaurant that does a medium-sized restaurant that does three cases a week of, of by the glass Chardonnay or by the glass Sauvignon Blanc, and if you know that you are literally pouring each ounce and not losing one single glass, that magnifies over and over and over throughout the, the, the year, it's staggering. No, you're absolutely right. And, and to Gary's point, um, you add that ounce and you multiply it by a thousand and, and, and that's a lot more. No, absolutely. Um, one of my bane, the banes of my existence when I was the wine director of a restaurant in Boston was inventory. Um, so Bobby, um, how do you think this format helps with inventory? Well, it helps a lot. You can really keep track of it. You can now put in a monitor on your, on your keg system to let you know how many uh, glasses is in the keg that has been poured. And you can just go off your POS system and go, oh, it says that I charged for 62 glasses of Sauvignon Blanc, and at look, I have 40 left. I've gone through 70. Uh-oh, maybe my bartender's giving something away or whatever, I can check in on that. Um, not that you want to think that theft is happening, but those things do, and you need to ha have, a, have a, a, a pulse on that. Also, inventory systems have gotten so much better. 
um, than they ever have. And POS systems have gotten so good. You can keep track of your inventories. The, the wine inventory systems are so much better than they used to be. I, I love seeing my team get done with inventory in three hours versus the marathon that it used to be do with the, oh my God. But also these tools are very useful for the F&B management team to make sure we're doing the right thing. There's so much out there now that we can use technology wise on inventory systems that makes things so much better. And I think the tech in this space is even getting more exciting and sophisticated. You know, uh, there, I, last week I had a great conversation with uh, two entrepreneurs who were developing a system to better manage how many camps. One of the things is that will all help better manage towards profitability. Um, I'm so sorry to interrupt. It's very exciting. Could you repeat that? I'm sure I would love to hear it. And unfortunately, you cut out. So could you repeat that? Uh, is that, that it's constantly helping you mute yourself, maybe when you should be. Okay. But. but Okay, Marion, you're frozen, so I'm going uh, to- Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Let's give it a try. Uh, sorry about everybody. Um, uh, no, all I was meant, it's exciting as well. Technology is increasingly playing a role in the on-premise. Uh, I just last week, I was speaking to two entrepreneurs who were figuring out how to better count the amount of pours that were done off of kegerator systems. That could all be data that would be sourced back to both the F the operators and to brands themselves that you can help manage by chain. Uh, and I think all of these different technologies when taken as a whole will be huge boons to the industry forward. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Marion. Um, Matt and Alan, I'm, I'm sorry, Matt and Kenny, we, we talked about waste already and eliminating waste. Um, I'm the ounces that people are wasting, but you know, what are the wines for Western Wilder that are in a can? What do you think works incredibly well? And um, there are very few faults or flaws that you can find with a canned wine where you open a bottle of wine, it's corked. It's not that you're going to lose it, but someone has lost money along the way. Um, could you just talk a little bit about not yeah. quite sure what my question is there, but no, no. I think I, think I know where you're going. Like, I mean, one of one of the things that comes to mind immediately is sparkling wine. Um, you know, it's 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 something that people oftentimes want a glass of, but um, rarely will drink a bottle of unless they're with company. And then also, you when it comes to on premise, you have this situation frequently where people maybe don't all want to drink the same thing. They want to drink different things, and um, and you know having having a variety of different wines available in that kind of smaller format makes that a little bit easier. Um, the other thing I've seen a lot of recently is people sharing, you know, we, we package our cans, uh, we package our wines only in 250 ml cans, which is what a third of a bottle. So it's a big, you know, it's a big glass um, or it's two small glasses. And we've seen a lot of the time people sharing that single can at a lunchtime or whatever. So it actually opens up wine to be more of a beverage at more frequent serving opportunities than just something, you know, a lot of people wouldn't have a small glass of wine, for example, at lunchtime, right? It would be taboo. Um, whereas being able to share something and have that little taste, I think makes the dining experience a little bit better, um, which is interesting. And also people oftentimes with, with by the glass, the wines are anonymous. You know, once, once your server or whatever has told you what is there or once you've ordered it off the menu, have you really remembered what it is you're trying? Whereas when, you, when you're sitting there with a can, you've got you know, a branded experience in front of you that you can refer to. And quite frankly, if your dining companion is super boring and you're having a terrible time, it gives you something to read. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, you made a, a comment about technology. Um, 
lots of things have sort of come out of COVID and one being more takeout in places that you wouldn't expect takeout to happen. Um, one of the things I'm hoping is that we continue to allow restaurants to um, include wine in their food deliveries. Mm -hmm. So I know that Alenia went from being that amazing fine dining restaurant to being an amazing takeout place. And, um, and that Bobby, you had a, a yurt, a yurt, I'm sorry, yurt village, uh, which was amazing to see you walking in the snow. But Gary, like how do you think people can get the most out of a takeout program? Oh, how can they get the most out of it? Um, there's a couple of different answers there. I think that first off is it's understanding what your brand is and figure out what aspect of your brand is, it, it can actually be transportable, can extend outside your walls and go into someone's home and still stay your brand. So that's step one. Two, it's, it's kind of understanding what does the guest want? And does, if they're looking for something from your brand, um, whatever that piece is, what are they actually looking for? And then I guess the third part is figure out where they sync up. So to use Alinea as an example, Alinea was a, a you know restaurant, you go in there, you're gonna have 18 to 22 courses. You may not see a plate. You know, you, you may not need silverware for three quarters of your menu. You may not recognize what's being placed in front of you as food. Um, so that was Alinea. When the world shut down for Alinea, it was March 16 of 2020. And four days later, they were doing to go they weren't offering any of that product. What they were offering was beef Wellington and coca vin, and they were doing high technique, high quality food that they wouldn't necessarily prepare at home, that from a Michelin three-star chef. So Grant Atkins preparing these dishes, sending to their home. So what the guest was looking for was, I need something comforting, I need something rewarding, I need something that's delicious, but obviously I can't go out and get it. So the, where they intersected was at that point. And that, that, that sinking and understanding of what can we do is the most critical because if it doesn't reflect your core values, then it's something else. So the benefit in to go is that you did a couple of things. You're expanding beyond your walls. Each one of our restaurants, if we have them, is going to have X number of seats. Well, if we're going to a takeout program or to, you know, delivery program, now I have the entire city at my disposal. So I have not my seats, I have your seats what's in your house or you, you know, in your place. And so I'm out there Two, I'm discovering a new market. There's people that wouldn't necessarily have been able to come to Alinea with our limited number of seats and our high demand that now we can access a much larger audience. People who didn't know this product was for them can now access it. And then I guess the third part is the profitability standpoint. In order to deliver the 18 to 22 courses we were doing in the restaurant, it took a ton of labor. You know, we had call it 70, well, 75 seats and we had 75 employees. It was almost a one-to-one -one ratio in order to produce that product at that level. It doesn't take nearly that to, to box up, to bag up, to send out. And so your profitability goes up. What we've seen since restaurants will be open is demand has shifted for us, but not for our entire product. We're selling pot pies on the West Coast. That demand is still there. So we are, are doing things out there, but here in the neighborhood, People can now just come into the restaurants or their own neighborhood restaurants so that shifts. So that to me becomes the benefit and how to approach it most accurately and, and to do it in, a, in something that's sustainable because otherwise you're just throwing stuff at the wall and it may or may not stick and you're not sure. You know, one, one thing to chime in on that, uh, Gary, and I really found a lot of inspiration from your guys' company. We we about a, a year ago, like a month into the pandemic, we started doing a Frost at Home series where we do it one night a week. Instead of having to go every night, we did one night a week, very limited team, but we could sell up to 200 kits with a bottle of wine, with a video of me and Carlin interviewing an Italian or a French or an Austrian winemaker, um, and then have our chef do a video, we do a video, um, you know, and it was amazing the bond it creates for the guests. Like it was staggering a year of doing this. Look, if I'm working at Tavernetta tomorrow night and I have guests at Frosca, there's no way I can have a connection with them. But every guest got a connection once a week that did that, not just with me, not just with Carlin, not with just with uh, Chef Kelly and Eduardo, but they really had a connection to the company. And uh, it was really, 
and it's still going on. We're, we're open and we're still doing at home and it's, it's maybe not as topped out as it was last May, but it's still really great. And there is very little waste because you shut off the, the order on Friday for a Sunday pickup. So you do exactly the amount of dishes and it's been pretty interesting. I, I really do love um, takeout in places that you never expected it. And um, I don't think mediocre is um, is acceptable. And so people know after over 12 months of being at home that they can make certain things. But that special touch from Fasca or from Alinea, they are craving that. And if, if they can't get there, but there's a fun video and there's all these touch points, I, I hope that this is truly here to stay. I love the restaurant kits that I've had. And I also love that cans do not weigh as much as bottles. And I'm sure the delivery people like that as well. <laughs> yes, I, I would say there's no question that it's here to stay because what, what happened over this period is, is the guests got used to being able to get a, a particular product in their home whenever they wanted it. And they, it became normal, uh, much like Zoom. Zoom is gonna be part of our world you know, going forward in a way that we didn't anticipate it being two years ago. Um, we, I'd never heard of it three years ago at all. So it's, it's just one of those. But that to go needs to be done in a manner that, that makes sense. Bobby, what you're doing, if it's once a week, that is absolutely perfect because you're able to control it. There's very little waste. It, you're able to anticipate it. And so is the guest. Everybody's expectations are met. And that's always the hardest part is just understanding what is the dialogue we're trying to have here? What's the communication? And if we can establish that, then we can move forward and do a great thing. If, it, if we're all guessing at it, that's where it becomes hard and it breaks down. Absolutely. Um, thank you. I mean, is, I'm assuming, Bobby, is, do you think there's some way of leveraging the, tech, the technology of, of canned wines for takeout? Is there something you do? 100%. I think it's great for takeout. I think it's also great, uh, you know, it could be, I think every bar should have canned wine. Every bartender should use to learn to use them because they're so single served. But uh, for the takeout, for sure, because the packaging is, is exciting and fun and you can play that into the whole whole experience. I mean, I think you have to look at part of the takeout experience is the packaging. You can't just put you, little touches have to be done to, to make it feel good when people get home and they open it up. I mean, um, and I think canned wine can really play into that really well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I have all of your wines here. Um, this is Weston Wilder. Can everyone see that well? Yeah. So, okay. um, this is their Red Lynn and then this yummy Lambrusco. Thank you, Bobby. And then this is a, a can of bubbly Archer Roos, which Very I've cool. been doing while talking. So thank you for that. Um, we have a couple of questions and we've just got a couple of minutes. Um, there's a question about the viability of bag and box as an alternative packaging. And Marion, you actually started with boxes. That's right, we did. Our Chiru's started that way. Um, you know, key to our founding has always been how do we bring the best value to consumers and at the uh, and bag and box, you know, we, when we launched, we were, you know, bringing in uh, our French, you know, our Provencal Rosé uh, in a three liter bag and box. And that, you know, we were selling it for $30. That's four bottles of wine for 30 bucks, which was a great deal for the consumers. Um, I still think bag and box is an awesome technology. I think that, um, you know, where the challenges that we had were around, consumer acceptance and buy-in. So one of the things that made CAM so great was that it was a relatively low entry point. Uh, you know, you could just buy one can. So one glass. Okay, Marion, I think we And I think that it's uh, So, I'm sorry, Mary, you're frozen. Um, but when you come back, we can talk about that. Um, 
I'm going to ask another question and how are educational institutions for hospitality pivoting to become better advocates for restaurants with staffing issues and forecasting changes in the industry post pandemic. Who would like to tackle that one first. Gary, you're up. <laughs> uh, sure. I mean, I, I, what, what I've heard is that in talking to the various schools around here, they're, they're talking to places like Kendall College, for instance, they're trying to figure out how to best integrate um, safety protocols or business acumen or all these different things as part of their curriculum and have been for a short term. I haven't heard a lot of them reopening. I don't know if they've started school again yet. So I don't know what they're doing in their curriculum specifically. I imagine that, that places like the Culinary Institute of America are going to dive heavily into this, but I haven't heard anything systemic that, that's been written about or talked about. And maybe from the coalition, it's possible. Yeah, I, I, heard, that, I heard today that um, in Portland, they used to have six culinary schools and they're down to one. Like they've had five closures this year that didn't make it. So I think that's a big concern. I know Johnson and Wales campus in Denver did close this year. Um, so those, those are, are, are real. Um, but I do think that, and I was on a call earlier today with my alma mater, Northern Arizona University, their HRM program. I think universities and, and culinary schools can really play a major role this year moving forward in getting employees ready to get out in the workforce. There's never been a better time to go get a job in the restaurant industry, right? Every restaurant in America is hiring today. Like, so it's a chance to do something different. And with a lot of different pay structures happening with like here in Colorado, um, well, our restaurants, not every way, but in Colorado, we moved to a whole house gratuity. So we raise the minimum wage, got, um, so the wait staff has the same minimum wage as back of the house, so we could distribute tips evenly. Amazing what that allows someone that might wanna take a risk on cooking that they were originally only wanted to be in the front of the house because they, they wanted that better income. So there, there's a big opportunity here and I wish the culinary schools and hotel restaurant management schools we're telling every one of their students, go get a go get your dream job this summer. I bet you you can get it. Uh, it's you touched on earlier. You talked about the whole burger flipper mentality. I was in a call this morning with a friend who, during the pandemic, expatriated to Copenhagen, and he's living there now. And and he was describing a circumstance where one, their education is is paid for by the state, so you get to go and go to university to study whatever you want to study. So someone who decides to be in a restaurant, whether it be front of house or back of house, has gone to school to learn how to be front of house or back of the house in a restaurant. Um, and that job is just viewed as another profession. It's not higher, lower, or anything. It's just something else. And that's where we need to get, where our universities or these, these schools we're talking about are, need to be held at a, at a level and a standard where they are just as applicable. And, and that means that the guests in our communities and our society has to view hospitality as the industry that it is. And it isn't some all saran, it isn't just an amenity for everyone's enjoyment. It's a necessary, critical part of the, the fabric of who we are as people. You're absolutely right. I mean, I think it's, um, the consumers also need, as you said, to understand that this is viable. I mean, I am also married to a European, so, this is a well-respected profession in Europe um, and not so much here on a certain level, absolutely. But this is a place for people to get work. And I think many of us started off as doing something else and fell in love and continue to do this. Um, so although I use psychology every day, my degrees in psychology, um, were put aside to 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 work in wine and i just think that this is an amazing industry and that it there's a lot of work still out front for this industry and restaurant tours and operators will need more information and guidance and community to be successful but it's not just coming from us it's also coming from the customers um this is a partnership that um we just need to work on a little bit harder 
Um, I, we have a few minutes. Would anyone like to add anything to this conversation? This has been so much fun um, and informative as well. I'm looking at you, Matt. <laughs> Pressure's on. Well, actually, one of the things Matt and I were chatting about just before this fired up was, was you know, we're, we're kind of doing a recap of the last 12 months as a business generally. And, and obviously, you know, there's challenges, right? And uh, the pandemic's been, it's affected everyone, obviously. But one of the good things that's come out of it has been the fact that um, we fast forwarded as an industry. You know, um, I keep reading about in the right. wine press about, how direct to consumer sales are up and e-commerce is amazing and all the rest of it. And it's like, well, these are things that all other parts of the, the world and all other industries knew for years, but the wine business is so slow and so traditional that it takes something like a pandemic to come along to get people to be cool with cans or bags and boxes or ordering their wine online or doing a Zoom tasting or whatever. And that's so that's one of the good things is that we've seen probably five or six years maybe even more of progress happen in one year mm -hmm. and i hope we keep that up because part the consumers want these products consumers want good quality at a good price that is fun and reliable and has a guarantee attached to it they want freshness they want a tasty beverage they maybe don't want all the time a wine whose name they can't pronounce or a product that they don't really understand or to be faced with a wine list in a, in a simple dining environment that is confusing for them and makes them feel silly. Sometimes they just want something that's good, right? And so I'm thinking that maybe, maybe this is the kind of the, um, the trigger, the fulcrum in a way to kind of fast forward things a little bit and get down to brass tacks. Like let's make wine a little bit more fun. Let's make it more approachable. Let's sell more of it. Let's drink more of it responsibly. Um, and let's grow, you know, and for me, that's that that goes hand in hand with sustainability, make it economically viable and sustainable, as well as better for the environment. That's such a great point. Absolutely. Bravo. Okay. Um, I think our time is up. Was there anything else anyone wanted to say before we let people get back to their days? I was wondering if Bobby was hiring. He said, said he had some positions available. <laughs> I'm hiring. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's a, we all, hey, <laughs> if, if you're a restaurant in the United States right now, you're not hiring, something's weird. Yeah. <laughs> that just means you're close. <laughs> yeah, yeah we're, we're hiring. It is game it's, on. It's dire, man. It, it's, we need bodies. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. This is such a great opportunity if someone wants to get into – the restaurant industry, this is the time to do it. Because they'll be able to move up faster than they've ever been able to before. Once they get in there and prove themselves, it's, yeah. Good point. Well, I think we get with the, with the toast to the, to, the, to the health of the bar and restaurant industry. Oh, cheers. Yeah, cheers. Cheers to that. Yeah, Thanks guys for putting this together. Yeah, thank you. Thanks to everybody for having us. Thanks for having us. I'll be coming I here soon. I hope this is the start of more conversations like this. So thank you, everybody. Agreed. Agreed. Yes, very much so. Thank you, everyone. See thank you soon. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks, Bobby. Marion, I'm going to call you.